Griner Talks about sustainability and transformation. A Griner podcast episode. How to change, how to create a sustainable future. That's what we're discussing here. My name is Alexander. I'm part of the sustainability team at Greiner. And this time, I'm taking you on a journey to COP27. I'm on my way to Egypt to find out what's happening at the UN Climate Change Conference in Sharm El Sheikh. COP27 is arguably the most important event of the year when it comes to protecting the climate. Since the first UN Climate Change Conference in Berlin in 1995, once a year the world is meeting up to negotiate nothing less than the future of our planet. The deadly impacts of climate change are here and now. 1.6 billion people already today live in vulnerability hotspots. It's more urgent than ever that we double down on our climate commitments. Today a new era begins. One thing is certain, those that give up are sure to lose. So let's fight together and let's win for the eight billion members of our human family and for generations to come. There's more than 50,000 people from around the world meeting up here in Egypt. It's all kinds of stakeholders who are coming together to share their perspectives and to find solutions. I'm speaking to some of them to give you an impression. My name is Kaluki Paul. I am a climate activist and environmental defender from Kenya, working to push for meaningful engagement of African youth. My name is Amy Goodman. We are here at COP27 to broadcast daily our global international investigative news hour on TV and radio called democracynow.org. Stefan Groselbeck, I'm part of the BCG delegation. We're here at COP because we have been supporting the Egyptian government in the preparation of the event and uh, help support the global climate transformation which is so required. My name is Leonore Gewissler, I'm the Austrian Minister for Climate Action and I am at COP because I'm one of the ministers pushing for ambitious climate action. Just when arriving in Sharm el Sheikh, I met my friend Kaluki Mutuku. He's an activist and a climate advocate from Kenya. And his message is a very clear one. The future is now. We cannot afford to fail on negotiations. We cannot fail to not deliver for Africa. We need climate financing, we need loss and damage facility, and we need action on our action plans in our countries. One of the biggest topics in climate negotiations is loss and damage, which refers to the compensation for the harms caused by man-made climate change. Kaluki describes why this is so important. Of course, we know Africa, we are the least to contribute to the climate crisis, yet bearing the biggest uh, problems when it comes to the crisis and so communities in Africa are suffering from uh, devastation of floods, uh, uh, droughts, famines and these are things that are happening now and here so loss and damage speak to how we can build resiliency and support these communities to adapt to the changing climate and, and really building systems that can really cushion them for the impacts while the calamities are happening so it's very crucial to have it and it's very crucial to give it to the communities. Hardly any country in the world has recently been more severely impacted by climate change than Pakistan. Fatima Yamin, who's a climate change expert and a member of the Pakistani delegation, shared with me in her own words what has happened in her home country. There has never been as much rainfall before. It broke 30-year averages. In the 90s, we always have a big flood every 10 years. But this was bigger than all of them. It was a century's record-breaking flood. Pakistan has less than 1% share in global greenhouse gas emissions. So a country that does not even have 1% share in the emissions has to bear the brunt of emissions by everyone else, including the global north. Climate impact does not look at any boundary. It does not look at any certain geography. It does not discriminate. Climate impact rules indiscriminately without looking at boundaries and cultures. So that is the message. That is the message by the minister. That is the message by Pakistan. 
what is happening in Pakistan is not limited to Pakistan. Walking around at this vast area of the UN Climate Change Conference here in Egypt somehow feels like being on a trade fair where everything is about climate change and finding solutions. There's companies, startups, civil society, activists, and even oil funds like the OPEC fund. When I walk by the Youth for Nature pavilion, I bump into an activist from Pakistan. Let's hear what Pervis from Fridays for Future Pakistan has to say. We want the COP to be the COP of implementation as it says. We are losing hopes, we are losing lives, we are losing everything, we are losing our uh, mental peace, we are losing health. Like it's our future, it's our present, and it's the present of the Gen Z, but still not, uh, we are not involved and we are not kept inclusive in policy making and on the tables. What we are thinking forward and what we expect from the COP27, it's the reparations for, the, for our losses, for our damages that the recent floodings, recent humanitarian crisis have caused to our country. In a somehow secluded area at COP27, you will find the meeting spaces of all the international delegations who are participating here. I had the chance to speak to the Austrian Minister of Climate Action, Leonore Gewessler, to ask her what's Austria's position in the long term on fighting climate change. We know we need to step up and we are willing to step up. Austria, as a country of the European Union, is a country in the world region that's really taking a leadership role on mitigation, on reducing carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. We have already voted a climate law that's valid for the whole continent with a legally binding goal of at least a 55% emissions reduction until 2030. And in Austria, our goal is even a bit more ambitious than that. So we want to be climate neutral by 2040. And so we're doing a lot of initiatives to reach that goal. So really doing that catch up race that we all have to do in climate action. It's a question of a future good life on this planet, of livable conditions for humans to live on this planet. So this is probably the biggest challenge that we face as decision makers, be it in politics be it in the private sector, being it civil society or the science community, we all have to step up and take the necessary decisions. It is an incredibly complex process to get there, to reach that point where we protect our planet. Can you give us a little impression of how do these negotiations work like? Are you fighting over simple wordings until two in the morning, over targets, over budgets? Can you give us some impression? Indeed, the COP is a super complicated process. Uh, it's evolved over many, many years. And actually, if you want to have only one indication why it's complicated, it's five conferences that run in parallel, actually. So there's a lot of different rooms in which negotiations take place. First, they start on a technical level, so the experts talk to each other, then they move in the second week to a political level, so the ministers come in and try to solve the difficult political questions. So how do you do that with 195 countries around the table? You organize in groups that have similar interests or, or have similar position. And so Austria is, of course, um, negotiating with the European Union as with one voice and with one weight in these negotiations. But other countries are the African group of nations, the small island and developing states. So it's really different groups around the table that try to come with common positions and then yes as in any negotiation also in the business world you talk about definitions about words about what exactly is our common understanding on different terms how do we want to proceed and what does this all mean in terms of money of course also that is a question on the table but i think what we really need to understand is that if we don't progress we all lose Thomas Seifert from Wiener Zeitung explains his point of view on COP27 and what he thinks about climate change. We're not out of the woods. We need more progress, we need more ambition. But again, everybody will be disappointed at the end because again, the, what we have to do is we have to aim high and uh, realistically we have to be happy if at least uh, some positive output is uh, coming out of uh, Chamechee. Next to Plenary 1 at COP27, that's where the main negotiations are taking place, you will find all kinds of news stations from around the world. You will find BBC, Bloomberg and also a platform called Democracy Now! 
Democracy Now!'s host, Amy Goodman, shares with me why she believes that transparent journalism and independent journalism is so incredibly important. It's absolutely critical to have independent media here. Media is the oxygen of a democratic society. We're in an authoritarian state right now in Egypt. Hundreds of people have been arrested in the lead up to and during this COP who are Egyptian. It's incumbent on everyone to be here to speak out on that issue. We are a journalist outlet and we provide a forum for people to speak for themselves. To, because it is the UN Climate Summit, it is joining these issues of human rights and climate action. Together, I think the word is climate justice. What kind of questions are your viewers, your listeners asking? What questions are you answering? Well, we are bringing out the voices of people who've come here from thousands of miles away and some right around the corner um, who are most impacted by climate change. We just had on an Amazon leader from Venezuela, um, women climate activists from Guatemala and Mexico, um, indigenous leaders from Canada and the United States, not to mention those that are here to decry what is happening in Egypt. And the only way there will be climate justice if all voices can be heard. And that's what Democracy Now! is about. I didn't come to COP27 by myself. I'm here with a group of colleagues, Austrian journalists and scholarship holders of the European Forum Altbach. My colleague Stefan, who's heading Greiner's sustainability strategy, explains why Greiner is participating as a company, what we are doing to tackle climate change and how to distinguish greenwashing from actual progress. We have to reduce our emissions as a company and there is lots of support here in actually finding solutions to reducing emissions. And you're not the only company that is attending this conference. There's many, many companies here. There's also more than 700 oil lobbyists here at this conference. How can we distinguish greenwashing from honest ambition, from actual progress? I think one way is really looking into third-party assessments of companies. I think there's ESG ratings, independent platforms looking into the performance of companies. And what is Greiner actually doing to fight climate change to reduce emissions? Well, we're doing quite a bit. Um, there is a green energy transition program at Greiner using more green renewable energy. We are looking into exchanging, substituting materials. We are looking into logistics and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that we have done already, but there's still a lot to do. Another hot topic at Greiner is science-based targets. Can you tell us something about that? What is happening here? Science-based targets are climate targets that are in line with the Paris Agreement. A while ago, we just had defined climate targets that were not in line. And we are very happy that just some days ago, we have submitted science-based targets with the Science-Based Targets Initiative. When it comes to companies and their bold promises on climate change, I believe there's nothing more important than transparency and real commitment to action. That's why it was especially interesting for me to speak to Amir Sokolovsky. He is CDP's Global Director for Climate. CDP is a rating platform that scores companies on their commitments and actions. Here's what Amir has to say. There's a 4 a.m. meeting every time you come to COP where you're depressed and think it's not worth anything. And it isn't. COP alone can't solve anything. But the point isn't that COP solves it, or the private sector, or civil society, or countries. The point is to do it together. You have mentioned it before that there's many non-state stakeholders here, more than ever before probably. There's also many companies here. What do you expect from big companies who are hanging out at COP? It would be naive not to expect that a meeting of this size would have people lobbying for their interest in both directions. The point of the UN and the point of meetings like this is not only to get a transition, but a resilient one. I expect them to say what they need to say, and I expect the voice to be evened out at the end. I don't expect them to be angels, but not to be devils. It is out of question that companies play an important role when it comes to climate change. Stefan Groß-Selbeck from BCG Digital Ventures shares his perspective. 
Well, they obviously play a key role, and we believe that there is an opportunity for companies to strengthen their competitive advantage by making their business more sustainable in a number of ways, from a market point of view, from a recruiting point of view, and from an overall business performance point of view. Whether COPs are the right way forward is a relevant question. Stefan focuses on the positive aspects of what is happening here. The past has shown that some COPs have made very, very important decisions which have really advanced the global agenda. This particular COP is more focused on implementation and getting to action, and that's very, very important as well. Fighting climate change is about so much more than business cases and emissions reduction. After all, it's about making everyone heard and supporting each other. That's pretty obvious when speaking to Katrin Harvey from the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. Uh, we are attending here to advocate for smallholder farmers and for adaptation finance and to really get the voices of youth and women heard when it comes to climate change and their realities. Katrin's message shows how interconnected the topic of climate change is. It's exactly this complexity that makes it so difficult to achieve progress quickly. So I wanted to know from her how many more COPs it will take to solve the climate crisis. I don't think we're going to stop having COPs in the close future. I think we still need them more. At the moment, it's all we have. I do believe that we need to think very clearly about how we can make it more efficient and more actionable and really show the world that people are doing a lot for climate change, that everybody is on board. We have to understand that this is a crisis that affects all of us, unequally so, and that we really have to start doing what we've been promising for the last 27 years and really step up and take action finally and not continue on working on voluntary commitments that sometimes happen and sometimes don't. When asked what's the single most important thing in fighting climate change, Katrin particularly points out the role of women in this global challenge. I think to really bringing women into leadership positions, bringing them to the conversations, bringing them to the decision making, making sure that we have more women part of this conversation. And I think we have a very, very far way to go for this still. I see so many young people and activists here at COP27 who are sharing their messages. So I want to know from the young activist Jeffrey Mboya whether youth feels heard and can actually influence decisions which affect no one more than they affect their generation. Oh, well, I feel very, very excluded. I am a youth activist from an urban informal settlement in Nairobi. And honestly speaking, I have really struggled on my own to find opportunities to be at a global event. I still feel we are not included in this kind of event and that's like a bigger gap. There need to be more spaces created and more opportunities opened up for youth and uh, people coming from such settlement. And so it's very significant and a big win for me to be here. On my last day at COP, I'm meeting up with Thomas from WWF Austria. He is observing negotiations, advising the Austrian delegation and sharing his impression of the process with us. I have the impression here that, that we are living on two different planets. One planet, a real planet, is getting hotter and hotter. And at the same time, at COP27, we are on this planet where it's all about uh, workshops, about timetables, about very process, very difficult technical issues. And uh, I'm under this very strong impression that those two planets are not living in the same universe anymore. There's more than 700 oil and fossil fuel lobbyists here around at COP27. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a worrying trend that they're getting more and more and that this COP is used as a venue where gas deals and, and other fossil deals are made. At the same time, um, there's also something positive. I think all these lobbyists uh, wouldn't be here if they wouldn't sense that this is that important stuff is happening here and that their way of, uh, of doing business and investing in fossil fuels is hopefully soon coming to an end. 
When I'm about to leave Egypt, the blue zone, that's the main area where negotiations are taking place, is slowly emptying. But the negotiations are not about to end. COP will most likely be extended another two days. What remains for me are mixed feelings. On the one hand, it's pretty cool to see that there's so many people coming together to find solutions, to exchange, to collaborate and to share their stories. On the other hand, it seems like the progress that we are making on an international level is only step by step and it's going way too slow to still limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. I'm asking all of my interview partners if they believe that we can still save the planet and limit global warming to 1.5. I don't know what we can do, I know what the effort that we have to put in is. And the effort that we have to put in is for 1.5. I believe in possibilities, so yes, we can with action, with love and with care. We are in this together, let us move forward together. I don't know about that. A 1.5 degree world is impossible right now. Because even if everyone stops their emissions, it's still going to take a few decades for the climate impact to, to die down. I'm not a climate scientist, so I cannot know, but I have to believe, otherwise we're doomed. And I don't want to have a doom and gloom attitude for my life. I've been doing this for a very long time, and I must remain a believer that we can do it as a global community. What I believe, I think, is not relevant in this case, but uh, what the climate scientists tell us is relevant, and they're telling us clearly 1.5 is not realistic, unfortunately. On the other hand, I think you have to be optimistic. Therefore, even if we don't make 1.5, let's do everything we can so that we don't head into a future that makes this planet unlivable. I am both skeptical and also uh, hopeful. We need to move beyond saying we are pledging 100 billion, we are pledging 100 million, we are pledging 2 billion. We need now to see how these resources will be allocated Climate action is not a matter of belief. Every part of a degree makes a difference for millions of people on this planet. So I will keep on fighting for every part of a degree as long as I'm here and in the time between the conferences. We can never predict what will happen when the bottom rocks the top, um, when the hierarchies are challenged, uh, and if I didn't believe it was conceivable, it would be hard to go on. We can restrict it to 1.1. Not even 1.5 is the ultimate solution. I think 1.1 degree is the ultimate solution uh, for everyone. It's a lot of skepticism around what is going on here, whether the process is designed the right way, and whether we can actually reach the 1.5 degree goal. But what also remains is a lot of hope, a lot of solutions, a lot of positive outlook into the future. And most importantly, the fact that we need a global forum to discuss global warming, to limit global warming. COP27 is implementation COP. COP28 might be a survival COP. So before we fight for survival, we should have to implement it on time. That's my takeaway. Thank you so much for listening, for joining me on this special trip to Egypt. I hope you got some insights into the UN Climate Change Conference. Stay tuned for the next episode of Greiner Talks and subscribe to our podcast. Greiner Talks, a Greiner podcast. Subscribe now.